could you do that? So forgive me if I mutilate the concept of a Bildung or play a bit too fast and loose with it. However, like uh, Roz and Julie, I will also take us back in history. Um, though I want to land first in the 18th century, when the concept of Bildung emerged as a necessity for the creation of the modern self-possessed individual, the citizen of the Enlightenment. Um, I, to understand the concept of the of expansive, liberating knowledge um, in the period, and, and, and really to also to interrogate Bildung, um, I go to the source, to Immanuel Kant's 1784 essay, what, Was ist Aufklaren, or What is Enlightenment? Or as the translation published in 1798 in England puts it, What is Enlightening? <laughs> I, I like the verbal sense of process in that one. But what is, what is enlightenment is the essay Foucault says, quote, marks the discrete entrance into the history of thought of a question that modern philosophy has not been capable of answering, but that it has never managed to get rid of. For our purposes, though, we might say that this essay also sounds the clarion call for Bildung, although this term's not mentioned in it. Um, Sapere ade, dare to know a motto we would hope our students live by. Yet the language Kant uses in urging men to free themselves from the chains of the unenlightened life in order to access free thinking is worth a bit of examination. The essay starts with a definition of enlightenment as a state of mind precisely not dependent on others. Here's the opening paragraph in full. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when its cause lies not in lack of understanding, but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without guidance from another. Sapere ade, that is, dare to know. Have courage to use your own understanding. That is the motto of enlightenment. Without guidance for others, set twice for emphasis. This is man alone throwing off the bonds of teachers and others who might restrain him. In our own age of crowdsourcing social media and collaborative learning, the solitary nature of enlightenment alone is worthy of comment. But there's something else I want to note in Kant's heaping up of anti-enlightenment scenarios. Foucault also comments on this, on, on how he defines through negative examples. Kant continues, it is so easy to be immature. If I have a book to serve as my understanding, a pastor to serve as my conscience, a physician to determine my diet for me, and so on, I need not exert myself at all. I need not think, if only I can pay. Others will readily undertake the irksome work for me. In this litany of the ways that authority blocks enlightenment across the domains of life, scholarly, spiritual, physical, note that amidst the list of what we might call knowledge professionals is an inanimate object. Books are called out as a hallmark of immaturity. Or at least I'm imagining books used in a certain way. Books as thinking machines, we might say. Books that prevent or dissuade the reader from kindling his own cognitive fire. Indeed, Kant deploys figures of machines and tools in a number of examples of anti-enlightenment anti -enlightenment processes in several spots in his essay. Here are several examples. So first, Rules and formulas, those mechanical aids to the rational use, or rather misuse, of his natural gifts are the shackles of permanent immaturity. Then we have some metaphors drawing on agricultural tool, tools. Um, as in this discussion of the way the guardians of society have made men afraid and have literally made them into beasts. Having first made their domestic livestock dumb and having carefully made sure that these docile creatures will not take a single step without the go-kart to which they are harnessed, these guardians then show them the danger that threatens them should they attempt to walk alone. And then similarly, a few will always think for themselves, 
A few who, after having, thrown them, having themselves thrown off the yoke of immaturity, will spread the spirit of rational appreciation. But it should be particularly noted that if a public that was first placed in this yoke by the guardians is suitably aroused by some of those who are altogether incapable of enlightenment, it may force the guardians themselves to remain under the yoke. Then we have this image of an all-encompassing social machine, sometimes necessary, but limiting nonetheless. Now, in many affairs conducted in the interests of a community, a certain mechanism is required by means of which some of its members must conduct themselves in an entirely passive manner. Here, one certainly must not argue. However, insofar as this part of the machine also regards himself as a member of the community as a whole, or even of the world community, and as a consequence addresses the public in the role of a scholar, in the proper sense of that term, he most certainly, he can most certainly argue. And finally, he concludes by noting that by advocating free thinking, the government finds that it can profit by treating men who are now more than machines in accord with their dignity. Free thinking, it is clear then, is freed from machines. What is missing here in Kant's work is a consciousness of its own mediation. We see here instead a denial of the essay's own technology. Famously, what is now seen as a standalone essay and republished as such on numerous websites nowadays was not. It, is, it, it also was not written as part of a larger treatise and published as a book. It appeared instead in a journal in response to a footnote in another issue about civil marriages and the clergy. This was part of a discussion that was, as Hege Johan has pointed out, a media event that several writers participated in during a year-long public dialogue. It would not have existed if it were not for the magazine's publication schedule. Kant's distaste for machines and denial of mediation, however, is merely my departure point in this paper, and just one example of the late 18th century erasure of technology from the scene of knowledge making. Indeed, this disavowal of mediation is central to the concept of Bildung itself, at least as it has been defined historically as, quote, the cultivation of the inner life, i.e. the human mind or human soul. The concept of Bildung interpolates the educated subject in specific ways for specific goals. It has been called the central tenet of bourgeois society, constructing citizens in terms of rational autonomy. Based on the Enlightenment's presupposition of an individual free to choose the path of knowledge, Bildung then is rooted in, 18, in an 18th century construction of human identity as that which transcends the mechanical. Human knowledge was not always understood in such rigidly binary terms, however. If we peer to the processes of literacy instruction in early modern England, for example, we see that writing was actu actually a resolutely material, or I'm sorry, mechanical process. Lessons usually started with specific instructions about the quality of ink and placement of the paper. Many students were expected to make their own pens. To create elite subjects adept in the arts of rhetoric, educators positioned school reading as part of a continuum of activities in which the student merged consumption of others' texts with his own spoken and written expression. Reading and translating were part of the gathering process in which the student called the choicest figures of speech for his own use as a writer and speaker. Students found and transcribed favorite quotes so, um, in, in their commonplace or copybooks so that, as one 17th century pedagogue put it, they may always have store of matter for invention ready at hand, which is far beyond what their wit is able to conceive. The processing of textual information so that it becomes an integral part of a moral, obedient, yet eloquent subjectivity was therefore a multifaceted function. It required the construction and operation of precise tools or instruments, the moving, copying hand, and the articulating voice accompanied by the gesturing body, in addition to the absorbing eye charged with locating and gathering rhetorical gems. Thus writing in the concept of the education of young men of means, though extending to other groups as well, was a physical skill based in the act and art of copying others' texts, starting with individual letters and copy books, moving towards brief moral aphorisms, then entire pieces, and ending with one's own declamation, deriving from but not slavishly reproducing admired works. 
These enlarging concentric circles of copying work through a set of, some, of specific somatic techniques and technologies to literally internalize cultural norms and ideals within a student body. In this culture, the merging of hand, tool, and mind resulted in a display of wit reflected in a display of penmanship. Thus, in 1605, James I writes to his son, Prince Henry, I confess I long to receive a letter from you that may be wholly yours, as well matter as form, as well formed by your mind as drawn by your fingers. For ye, for ye may remember that in my book to you I warn you to beware of that kind of wit that may fly, fly out of the end of your fingers, not that I commend not a fair handwriting. This, uh, Thus, fair handwriting was seen as an important part of the humanist education as well as a preparation for the business world. For those not privileged to employ a master penman, the technique could be learned through books such as this, um, where, you, where you can see actually see evidence of you know, someone copying. This, the big letters are um, engraved print. This is from a print copy book. And that's, uh, the command is not a typo, that's how uh, it's spelled. And here is another example um, put together by writing master George Bickham, a renowned engraver who gathered the works of the period's best penmen over um, a period of eight years, engraved them in folio copper plates, then printed and sold the sheets separately by subscription. Uh, this page is especially interesting because it calls attention to its mediation quite explicitly. Um, though it seems to be meant for, uh, or the work itself uh, seems to be meant as much for appreciation as instruction. The tooled hand is evident throughout these little aphorisms. And so instead of having moral aphorisms or religious sayings here, you actually have sayings about the pen itself. Um, sure in its flight, though swift as angels' wings, the pen commands of the bold figure springs. While the slow pencil's discontinued pace repeats the stroke, but, can, but cannot reach the grace. The, um, the pencil uh, repeating the stroke being the student trying to attain the level of the master. How justly bold when in some master's hand the pen at once joins freedom with command. With softness strong, with ornaments not vain, loose with proportion and with neatness plain. And lastly, our virgin paper, when the hand we trace, how new, how free, how perfect every grace. So smooth, so fine, the nimble strokes we view, like trips of fairies over the morning dew. Wrap up, getting quite poetic about um, penmanship. However, it was not just writing masters who thought 